Well, good morning, folks. Happy almost Veterans Day. I won't be seeing you guys here uh, on Veterans Day, which is tomorrow. So I'd like to extend a heartfelt happy Veterans Day, especially to our veterans here. Today, we are in part two of our world tour of selected ecosystems. We're going to start off with kelp forests. So the picture that you see right there is from San Francisco. You can see there, those are the tops of the giant kelp. The kelp can reach up to 100 feet in length. And uh, there's nearby Alcatraz Island across the bay. So kelp, its habitat, is cold current, cold current. Uh, this image here, which we've seen before, actually depicts kelp. You can see kelp in the cold areas, a little bit on our east coast. It actually extends a little further than this image. I did uh, my graduate work about where the cursor is now studying kelp, but it's generally a West Coast species because the West Coast of continents gets the cold current. Your mangroves, mangroves are the coastal trees that can live in salt water by uh, regulating their salt balance. They can only live in areas that do not freeze. So you can see we get our, our mangroves here in Florida and then uh, down near the equator. Uh, mainly on the east coast of continents because of the warm currents. In conjunction with this, what's not shown, but which kind of follows suit, is the coral reefs. And we'll be looking at coral reefs after kelp, uh, our next habitat, but that reef building coral is also only suited for warm habitats. So kelp is the most abundant cold habitats. It belongs to the division Phaophyta brown algae. Uh, we wrapped up last lesson with Sargassum, which is a brown algae that is a warm water brown algae. We get that here, that gulf weed, and it forms the weed mats in the Sargasso Sea. Kelp, many of the kelp have floats, and they form uh, weed mats in the North Pacific gyra, because you can see North Pacific here, and then here, cold uh, kelp is abundant. So kelp forms a forest almost, and after about 80 feet in depth, you really don't get kelp. Giant kelp can grow up to 100 feet, but they need that top part, as you can see, for their blades to soak up the sun. So, you know, they form like a canopy in a forest, uh, the kelp uh, habitat. So it gets really dark down near the uh, lower ocean uh, because the kelp uh, shade, shade it. Uh, kelp is harvested here. You can see this fella is harvesting laminaria. This is the stuff that I studied here on the East Coast in the Gulf of Maine. So kelp is, is very um, economically important as well. So uh, you really don't get to New York. I haven't seen much kelp, but uh, above Cape Cod, uh, Groton, Connecticut, areas like that, you get uh, that beautiful rocky intertidal zone and kelp and all the algae, it's a totally different like alien landscape and seascape compared to what we have here, uh, the rocky intercoastals and then the kelp forests and such. West Coast kelp, there's that giant kelp macrocystis, uh, very, very abundant, uh, world's most productive kelp uh, forests. 
and they belong to the brown macro, macro meaning large algae group in the kingdom protista. They are the world's largest protists. Uh, kingdom protista, phylum Phaophyta. Uh, they are not grouped with plants because they do not have multi-celled reproductive organs. They do not have uh, leaves and, and structures. The, the, the blades are, are analogous to leaves. They're, they're analogous. Uh, they don't have a root system. They, have, they cement themselves to rock. So they're not considered plants. They're considered to be protists. Uh, here is the anatomy. The blades are analogous to the leaf. You generally have the glass bladders, like in Sargassum II, these little um, gaseous filled bladders that allow them to float. They cement themselves with a hold fast, uh, and the stipe is analogous to a stem. So the whole, uh, whole photosynthetic body is called the frond, and then the hold fast is like a fibrous that grips rocks or hard surface. And kelp is one of the fastest growing organisms. They can grow more than two feet per day. So they can grow really rapidly. Uh, they can live up to six years, even floating. They don't need, because they don't pull nutrients through their hold fasts. They get their nutrients from the water. So they can live equally well in these huge floating mats as they do attached. The largest and most famous kelp is Macrocystis. That's a genus, that's why it's italicized. And you can see this is what they look like. They do have their gas bladders and they grow up to a hundred feet. Some of the Kelp genera that I studied, the East Coast kelp, belong to a uh, genus called Laminaria. And uh, here, Digitata, Larncarpus, Saccharia, these are all Atlantic coast kelp. So we commercially harvest kelp for iodine. Uh, food, food, a lot of the sushi, seaweed uh, based foods. Uh, Many anthropologists, sociology majors and stuff, study human movement. And it's believed that humans colonized the Americas following that California current down for its abundant ecosystems, which are based on kelp. A lot of food there in the kelp forest. We harvest kelp for alginate, which is a carbon carbohydrate used to make gels. So gelatin, jelly, uh, salad dressing, cream cheese, toothpaste, soft dog food. These are just a few of the um, uses of this uh, gel. Uh, ultrasounds, that gel they spray on, use kelp-based. We use it in medical labs, in agar agar. Uh, laminaria sticks are used medicinally for childbirth. So the kelp is very important commercially. Um, the ecosystem is like a forest. It's very dark in the understory, and the canopy blocks all the light. Many things live in the uh, kelp forest. The sea urchins are, are grazers. The abalone in the West Coast uh, is a very expensive delicacy. It is a huge, huge snail. It looks almost like a clamshell, but it only has one side, and it lives, it's a huge snail. Uh, very shiny on the inside. That shininess is called mother of pearl. Mother of pearl is, uh, our shells have mother of pearl too, that shiny area. It's also referred to as the nacre. Um, that's where uh, the mantle collects and secretes a shell. A lot of isopods analogous to our insects live in this area as well. Huge jellyfish, uh, seals. Seals live in the kelp forest. Uh, sea otters on the west coast. Seals on all coasts, as far as the kelp forest goes. Seals are very blubberous. Uh, they don't 
do well in warm water because of that blubber. That's why we don't get seals and sea lions here in the Gulf. Uh, but the seals, because they're blubberous, love that cold water and kelp forests are their home. So there's seals and sea lions up in the Gulf of Maine in our uh, hemisphere, on our coast, the East Coast, and they're on the West Coast as well, seals and sea lions and such. And of course, with seals and sea lions, you've got the white sharks. So white sharks are common predators in kelp forests. In the West Coast, we discussed when we talked about migration, the California gray whale, they follow that California current down the kelp forests when they're pregnant and they give birth in uh, Baja in the warm water. Uh, and then they have to swim back up north once the baby's strong enough because their food source is up in the cold water because cold water is nutrient rich. Uh, these, this is an image of a mola mola or ocean sunfish. This is the most massive fish in the sea. Um, we learned the whale shark is the largest and longest, which it is, and the oar fish is the longest bony fish, but this guy is the record holder for mass, uh, weight. Leopard sharks are kind of cool sharks. They got this spine uh, there. Uh, they live in the kelp forest as well. So kelp forests can be over harvested, which is a uh, threat to it. Uh, we humans harvest kelp, grow kelp because it's so commercially important. Uh, some countries don't have regulation. Uh, it's difficult to regulate. We actually farm kelp. It's kind of cool. Uh, they have these big ropes, even thicker than the ones that uh, we used to have in gym class where I couldn't climb, but some people could climb the ropes. And they uh, put cuttings of the laminaria or the kelp on it and put it in the water and the kelp grows from it right on the rope. Then they tow the rope in with all the kelp growing on it. So they harvest it by cutting it or farm it. Uh, fresh water, fresh water carries uh, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and that is a threat to kelp forests. Uh, the cold nutrient rich water is important. So as global warming gradually increases, the tropical species put pressure on the cold water species. Here's a cool picture of a kelp harvesting boat that kind of mows the lawn. And this is from the 1930s. We've been uh, harvesting kelp for many, many years. Here's uh, kelp hanging to dry for commercial purposes. So the kelp forest is really the apex cold water ecosystem. Many consider the coral reefs the apex warm water ecosystem. This is a piece of brain coral uh, in Key Largo, Key Largo. Uh, so here's a piece of brain coral. It's massive. You can see there's a uh, fellow diver uh, in the uh, background. And these are a type of snapper called schoolmasters. Uh, so this was taken in Key Largo, a huge piece of brain coral would fill my office, which is a pretty big room, uh, and then some. So coral belongs to the phylum Cnidaria. That's that silent sea, Cnidaria class anthozoa, and they are polyps. Uh, Medusa are the jellyfish with the tentacles hanging down in kingdom uh, Animalia phylum cnidaria. And the polyps have their tentacles pointing up and they tend to be cemented to something. So corals uh, are polyps. There's two types, the solitary coral, or colonial coral. Uh, colonial coral is what builds reefs. Solitary coral can be found worldwide. Just like our warm water 
Mangroves, the coral reefs, are found in the warm water. Now you have some scattered coral in cold water, but that's not the reef building coral. That is the solitary coral. So solitary coral can be found all over, sea whips, sea fans, things like that. But the big reef building coral are confined to the equatorial latitudes. Here is a little piece of coral. You can see these are the polyps. Each polyp is an identical clone of the original larva that settled in this hard area. The larva settles, clones itself, and grows into polyps. They're all individual organisms. So this guy's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can count that many different coral animals, but they're all clones. So they actually reproduce by alternation of generation. That means they have a sexual stage, sperm and egg. They have an asexual stage, clone. They have a sexual stage, sperm and egg. The advantage of asexual reproduction is you don't need a sexual partner and you can reproduce rapidly. The advantage of sexual reproduction is genetic recombination. So you have a diversity of characteristics. Evolution can ensure the survival of your species this way. So these organisms have an alternation of generation, which means they shuffle the genetic deck sexually, and then they clone themselves to fill their community with them direct competition with other species of corals. Then they reproduce sexually again for genetic recombination. So that is alternation of generation. And that's the strategy, the reproductive strategy that corals use. So a coral head is really thousands and thousands of individual coral that came from one parent. And that one parent came from two parents. So as you can see, that is the alternation of generation and the construct of coral head growth. And the anatomy of the polyp, they are only two cell layers thick with mesoglea or gel in them. Their tentacles, their tentacles have these stinging cells called nematocysts. They have one opening, which serves as both their mouth and anus. Lower animals only have one opening. It's called a sac-like digestive system. Higher animals have two openings, tube within a tube, digestion, or complete digestion. These guys have a radial symmetry, which means they're round. That's a contrast to us. We're bilateral you can get two relatively equal halves, a left and a right, slight differences, but relatively equal. Radial symmetry is round. They have these stinging cells called nematocysts, which actually are spring loaded with, and then when triggered, they shoot that barb out, stunning the fish, plankton, or hurting the diver that touches it. We're obviously strong enough to break these threads and swim off with a barb stuck in you, and that's how you get infection. Um, a lot of these barbs have toxins on them, which lead to uh, allergic reactions or pain. Uh, stunt, you know, Because the strategy is to catch prey. And if you have uh, a little bit of toxin on the tip of your arrow, you can... Uh, neutralize your prey, it'll die or become paralyzed or whatever, uh, easier to capture. Nematocysts, is, they're found in all of the cnidaria. That's that defining factor of phyla cnidaria. Now, the reef building coral is called hermatypic. Here is a picture of its tissue. 
These are little dinoflagellates that live in them. So they have an algae, dinoflagellate algae called zooxanthellae. And these zooxanthellae live in the tissue of hermatypic coral. They are one organism, although they evolved from two because dinoflagellates are different from a coral polyp, but now they live in symbiosis and that's an endosymbiotic relationship, meaning inside living together. You cannot separate one from the other. As a matter of fact, with global warming, the ocean temperatures are rising slightly. This is causing the zooxanthellae to die and the coral to die, that's called bleaching. So coral bleaching is caused by environmental distress and the death of that zooxanthellae, which in turn kills the coral animal, leaving behind their white skeletons. Algae then usually grows on that white skeleton and you get slimy overgrowth where there used to be uh, diverse coral communities. So the hermatypic coral is the um, reef building coral, reef building. They have multiples of six or eight tentacles, more than eight or six multiples. Here's brain coral, pillar coral. These are common hermatypic corals that you would find if you decided to go scuba diving down in the Keys or Lauderdale, Boynton Beach, those places with the Gulf Stream. Uh, the Caribbean Reef Tract, which the Florida Keys are just at the tip of, third largest reef tract in the world. You can get mushroom coral, lettuce coral, star coral, each one of these is individual polyps. Staghorn or elkhorn. Uh, elkhorn looks like a moose antler almost. Staghorn, kind of like a deer antler. And you can see on there, there's thousands of little polyps on this coral head, all made by clone. The ahermatypic corals are also called octocorals because they always have eight tentacles. They don't have symbiotic algae in their tissue, so they are not environmentally sensitive. They can live in a variety of environments. They're very hardy, but they cannot reproduce and colonize the way reef building coral do. They then are more isolated in small groups versus reefs. So we get sea fans and gorgonas, uh, Sea whips, soft coral, sea whips. So uh, it's still illegal to possess any coral. If you, because uh, coral is so sensitive, jewelry and things are made out of coral. So you cannot possess coral, it's protected. Even if you find a piece dead, you're supposed to just leave it alone uh, because. Um, uh, a DEC agent wouldn't know where you got it from. You know, if you find a little piece and you, uh, you know, washed up on the beach, they're more or less targeting people that uh, have a lot of coral and sell it illegally. Coral reproduction, I mentioned that we have alternation of generation. Uh, when we uh, talked about the tides, we learned that they're broadcast spawners. So corals are broadcast uh, spawners. They uh, release sperm and egg into the tidal flow. This is what it looks like. The eggs pop out and float around and the sperm looks like smoke coming off of uh, the reef. I've been fortunate enough as an underwater uh, diving enthusiast, a dive master back in my youth, uh, to do night dives and photograph uh, at night using spotlights and stuff. It was a lot of fun. So I got to witness uh, broadcast spawning and uh, 
it does attract a lot of fish because you know it's like an omelet all the eggs just flying off and the fish darting in and out eating all the all the eggs as they're uh being you don't really lay them like a bird they float off on the on the tides so it is um, night dives are pretty pretty uh crazy and pretty uh unique uh, if you are a dive enthusiast or interested in being coming a diver, I highly recommend uh, professional training for one, because it can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. But I highly recommend diversifying your dives, including night dives, seeing the octopi and, and just things that you wouldn't normally see during the day are, uh, is, is quite a thrill. Uh, so coral reefs are called the rainforests of the sea because of their diversity, because of their diversity. So it's not just a piece of coral. You have hundreds of different species of coral in the Atlantic, 700, thousands in the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is a much older, as we learned, than um, the Atlantic. So diversity in older communities is always higher than in younger communities. Uh, so coral reefs are very diverse communities. Uh, thousands of species, as you see in this, in thousands of species rely on coral. You only have 700 species in the Atlantic only. That's quite a bit of species. That's good diversity. But that supports over 5,000 different molluscan species and over 2,000 different fish visit coral reefs. So tens of thousands when you add up all the different plants, animals, the different algae uh, rely on coral reefs. But the diversity is much greater in the Indo-Pacific Rim, much older uh, habitats. So the base of your food chain the zooxanthellae or phytoplanktonic algae or other algae mats. So algae, including the algae living in the coral, form the base of coral reef food chains. Some of the reef dwellers, uh, you have your sponges. Nudibranchs are uh, slugs, sea slugs, naked, naked lung that translates to uh, fish, everything from the reef sharks, which would be the highest uh, in the reef community, groupers, those goliath groupers, giant groupers, uh, to small little clownfish, all, all different types of fish, uh, jellyfish, anemones, sea stars, crustaceans, sea turtles, sea snakes in the Indo-Pacific, there are snakes that live there. They are, uh, they've evolved from cobras. They have cobra venom. And instead of the hood being around their neck, their hood is lower and they use it as a tail. They are very susceptible to getting eaten by sharks because they have to go up and breathe. Uh, snails, mollusks, a lot of birds feast on coral reef animals. Uh, this is a black tip reef shark. You can see here's the black tips on its uh, fins. Black tip reef shark. Uh, this was uh, taken in the Bahamas. Here's a uh, reef octopus. Here, look, there's your coral right there. That's a little coral. So this is a coral garden. You have different, there's one species, there's another species there. There's another species. So this is a little coral garden. All this white sand around that coral is um, calcium carbonate from uh, coral breaking off and uh, being pulverized into sand. And then there's an octopus. Here's from a night dive. Look, there's a trumpet fish living in a little garden of uh, Gorgonian coral right there. So that is great camouflage. Uh, here, here is a uh, green, green e eel. Uh, notice, look at these colors here. You don't see that with your eyes. That's because you photograph with a strobe. 
Remember, light attenuation occurs, so the reds are filtered out within the first 10 feet. So if you're below 10 feet, you don't see this with your eyes unless you have a strobe. So the ocean has a lot of hidden color because of that light attenuation. So here you can have encrusting algae and little sponges that you would not be able to see with the naked eye. Uh, but when you use a flash and you bring up and then you uh, look at your pictures, you'll notice that it's not like you remembered. It's so different because the strobes definitely uh, add wavelengths of light that aren't present. Here is a green sea turtle uh, sitting in a coral garden. And you know, look at all the diversity of coral right here uh, with that green sea turtle. I actually uh, found him because I heard chewing. So I kind of followed the noise and uh, found this guy. This was in Mexico, Mexico. So he is a, a Mexican sea turtle. Oh, barrel sponge, queen angelfish. Uh, there's two butterfly fish. They travel in pairs and they got these false eyes. And that's to scare predators. Uh, you'd see two eyes and they're like big and moving. You're like, whoo, I can't attack that. Uh, but really it's small fish with false eye spots. Uh, here, look, there's sea fan. There's one of your solitary corals. And, and so a coral reef, is not just one big piece of coral. There's a little brain coral back there, barrel sponge, tons of different fish. Uh, so the diversity of, that's a Florida Keys uh, shot right there. Uh, the diversity of coral reefs is rivaled only with rainforests uh, on our planet. This is the crown of thorn sea star. This eats coral. Another thing that eats coral is the parrotfish. Parrotfish are awesome. They bite and chew coral and you can hear them crunching away at the coral and they poop sand. So these white sand beaches associated with coral reefs generally are made by organisms. The parrotfish produces over a ton of sand every fish a year. Uh, pooping out sand and then that sand washing ashore. So they, the biological uh, importance of these uh, fish even extends to the beach formation. Um, now, Darwin was the first to uh, classify reef formation uh, around islands. And the first uh, fringing reef, you can see here's, here's an island, could be Caribbean, could be an atoll in, uh, Hawaii area, but that coral reef is really close to the island. So it's called a fringing reef. So you could just like snorkel off here and be over some of the most beautiful coral reef and only be 50 yards away from shore. Uh, this occurs in the Caribbean because Caribbean is a volcanic island arc and it occurs wherever there's a volcanic island arc in a warm ocean, really. You get these fringing reefs. But they're real heavy. And as the volcano goes extinct, uplift stops, and now subsidence occurs. So you wind up with a barrier reef. The reef is a little further offshore because the island sunk. This lagoon or intracoastal, like ours, we call it the intracoastal. It's called a lagoon in, in many places. Uh, so you have your barrier reef your lagoon, and then your island. Eventually that island is totally gone and we call that an atoll, a circular reef that is associated with an island. Our Florida Keys reefs and most reefs are this, okay? You have your island here, the Keys or whatever. Then you have your long flat seagrasses, seagrasses and sand. You can cruise around in a boat and there'll be patch reefs, little, little areas of coral, little areas of sand, little areas of seagrass. And uh, gosh, when we used to go lobstering, you'd uh, drive your boat around looking for little patch reefs. The water's clear so you can see a little, little dark spot down. You'd scuba dive down, grab a lobster, pop back up, head off. Uh, 
seagrass beds, sand. The hogfish love the sand. They root through the sand for uh, crustaceans and stuff that are around reefs. Then you get to your reef. So you have your reef and on the seaward side of the, the downslope, that's where the coral grow the most. 60 to 80 feet is optimum for your coral reef. Uh, because the waves and stuff disturb coral, that, that zooxanthellae need enough light, so it can't be too deep. You can't really get 100 feet, 150 feet, starts getting too deep for coral to grow. Uh, but shallow, you get a lot of sedimentation, a lot of uh, um, the sediments land on the coral, they block out the sun. So optimum is about 60 to 80 feet where it's calm and the coral really, really pop around there. So you have your reef flat and the little crest, uh, and then uh, you have your flat crust and then your front. And the front is where your big coral heads are. So uh, that's the crest and, and, the, and then the face. Once you get below, uh, a certain point, hermatypic corals disappear. You get sea fans and stuff that can still live there. So coral reefs are very sensitive. Eutrophication is one of the main things that kill them off. Sedimentation and then various diseases and environmental change bleaching. So eutrophication, we study nutrient runoff. Sedimentation, we've studied dredging, filling, human activity, storms, what have you. What we haven't seen is the black band disease. Black band disease is a bacterial infection in coral. There's the black band. As it moves, it kills the coral. White band disease is similar in the fact that uh, it's a pathogen that's moving. Bleaching is entire reef systems die due to environmental stress, especially temperature change. Uh, I did mention the hard bottom. We have hard bottom reefs here. They're not made of hermatypic coral. We have a hermatypic coral on ours. We call ours the Swiss cheese bottom because our limestone has areas that are exposed and then there's sand, mud, seagrass, and it's patchy. So our hard bottom, then you have your patches, and then the bank reef. Some cool things about coral uh, reefs, symbiosis. Uh, there's cleaning station. Here's Jacques the cleaning shrimp, cleaning some loose skin from around this diver's uh, teeth. But in real life, they pick the gills and the parasites uh, clean from fish. And fish line up for miles around. Here's a hogfish, coral head, and cleaner gobies, uh, picking parasites, dead skin, scales, loose scales off of our fish, keeping them healthy as well. So there's like a little barber shop down there. It's it's cool. Uh, scuba diving. I ran into this. I, I took uh, some most of these images. I took. I didn't take this. This one's not not mine. No, but these ones are. These little cleaning gobies are picking off the uh, hogfish's uh, parasites. And then there's fish waiting to take its place. So here's coral's uses, why they're so uh, endangered outside of environmental change. People, people harvest them and use them for jewelry and uh, fish tanks, things like that. Uh, also, the um, if you touch them, a lot of times they die, those polyps die. So when you're scuba diving, you gotta be careful not to put too much sunscreen on because you can um, pollute the water that way, at least locally, and uh, not to touch your coral. Now, one of the most unique habitats in the sea are the forest of worms we find around deep sea vents and cold seeps. Here's a forest of worms. These can go up to eight feet. You can see there's some fish, crabs, octopi, all living in this forest. These are tubes 
generally parchment-like, so they are flexible, it's not solid. And then the plume or the tuft of flesh that sticks up contains bacteria that chemosynthesize. So these are two worms with bacteria living in their skin, acting as trees, chemosynthesizing in the deep sea areas. They were first discovered in 1977 in the Galapagos Islands, but they have been since confirmed uh, along all of the ocean ridges. We call these communities hydrothermal vents because they spew out chemicals. Most of them are sulfur containing. That sulfur is used to oxidize the carbon dioxide molecule, turning it into carbon carbohydrates. We studied chemosynthesis when we looked at marine ecology last week. The vent communities then are all along, all along these oceanic ridges, but they're difficult to study because lack of light and the depth. So many more exist than what we have studied because we're limited with the deep sea submersibles. The food chain relies on sulfur oxidizing bacteria. It can be free living, living on mats. It can be symbiotic, living in those two worms that I showed you called Rifta, or giant clams called Claptogenia. They also house symbiotic bacteria. So here's the tube rain for the tube forest here, tube worm forest. Uh, Rifta with associated crabs. Here is a area littered with these deep sea clams, Claptogena, that uh, have this bacteria living in their tissue. And as they filter the water, uh, chemosynthesis occurs. Then you get a lot of amphipods grazing on them and snail, shrimp, worms. Over 300 species have been discovered as vent species. Not as diverse as coral reefs, but still rather impressive for a lightless ecosystem. Some of the cooler organisms that live here, the vampire squid, the amphipods, the Dumbo octopus, ours our friend Nemo's enemy, of course, the anglerfish, uh, red lantern jelly. Most, most, uh, you can't say all, most of them are bioluminescent, and most of them lack great pigmentation or appear red when you pull them up because red light's the first to attenuate, but there's really no light down there. So most of them uh, are pretty drab in coloration uh, indeed. So ghost crabs and tube worms, uh, clear, clear is another thing, brittle stars combing the sea. So that's a unique deep sea community that's found on ridges. But there's more. You know how there's springs on land? Well, there's under ocean springs and mineral waters welling out of those. Uh, they were discovered first in the Gulf of Mexico and they are called cold seeps. So here is an undersea spring with nutrient rich water flowing out, being chemosynthesized and entire ecosystems cling to these little springs. These are called cold seep ecosystems, cold seep. And they were first discovered in the Gulf of Mexico. So entire communities of light independent organisms have developed around these cold seeps. And these cold seeps are with chemoautotrophic bacteria at their food chain. Chemo means chemical, Autotrophic means producing their own food and their bacteria. So chemoautotrophic bacteria basically uh, power these ecosystems of the deep that don't have any uh, light whatsoever. Well, we have toured many unique ocean ecosystems and we have just concluded our marine biology unit. Please remember, 
Tonight, you have your field guide and discussion number five due. Monday, we will return to class and start talking about environmental concerns. And we will have a review session for the marine biology quiz. Again, I would like to thank all of the veterans out there for their service and wish everybody a happy Veterans Day. This concludes our lesson for the day. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them right now. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend, weekend. everybody. I got a question, Professor. Well, please ask. Uh, for the field guide, uh, do, do we take a picture of like any univalves and bivalves instead of like going out to the beach and like trying to take a picture of them? Well, as I explained, uh, I'll always give uh, more consideration towards your own pictures, but being you waited to the day it was due, I would expect you'll probably be looking and using the internet. Uh, I'm going to make, uh, have to hold you to uh, properly citing every picture that you use. Right. Okay. So, I mean, right now, I, I don't think you're gonna run out and get 20 or 30 pictures off the beach uh, being you waited to the day it was due. Uh, so, um, but I, I do expect you to have everything properly cited and identified. Okay. So like how many? Like, I'm gonna ask you to read the instructions. Yes. To, to get the exact number and how to set it up. I have gone over that in class. I don't have the assignment directly in front of me. So you're gonna have to um, log in and have a look yourself because I don't wanna give you bad information. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.